Selma met me at the opera. She was standing in the middle of the street, cars were zooming past, she didn't seem faced by it, but I took note of it and I was worried about her. We never met before. My sister and I just walked out of a Bayer Sebak poetry reading at the opera building itself, and we decided to call to her. We did, she followed, and she stood next to us. By the way, she's a dog. I told my sister to not pay any more attention to her from that point on, because what was I going to do? Take care of this dog, make it my own? I'd only just moved to Armenia less than a year ago at that point, and so we didn't pay any attention. But that didn't make a difference. Soma followed us all the way home. Well, I gave her name away. Um, she wasn't named at the time. She followed us all the way home, looked at me with expectant eyes, sat in the elevator with me, went into my apartment, and spent the night. And she's never left since. So here I was with this dog who seemed to know what she was doing. She seemed perfectly trained. She didn't do anything wrong in the house. She even had a scar on her belly. So clearly she'd been spayed. I thought, okay, this is someone's dog who ran away from home, followed me home, and now I've taken away someone's best friend. But for a week she walked around next to me without a leash, and I figured, all right, I guess, I guess this is love. And uh, one day I got a phone call from my sister, a friend of a phone call. She said that someone in the street had stopped her and said, hey, I recognize that dog. And she had panicked because, great, she was going to lose her sister's new dog on her watch. She called me and I told her to listen to the man and see what he would have to tell her. And so she did. And this man led her to a courtyard nearby, a Hayat. And what she learned from there is something that I'm still learning today. Soma was definitely a street dog. And she wasn't named Soma, she was named Sib. Even though I had named her Soma after the Yelisha Chaden's poem that I was translating at the time when we met, that Hayat called her Sib. And later I learned that there was another Hayat, a little bit, a little ways over, that called her Berch, because they thought she was a guy. <laughs> um, the residents of this <coughs> courtyard were so thrilled to see Soma, uh, because apparently she would go there every single day, and for a few days she hadn't shown up, and they thought she'd been picked up by dog catchers. They said they'd been crying, they'd had sleepless nights, they checked all the dog pounds, ready to pound some skulls when they found the person responsible for picking her up. Uh, and they looked at me, and they, they looked at my sister, and they said, we must meet the owner. So I went, and they said, you are a guardian angel. You're an angel. You saved this dog. But I made it very clear the dog picked me. So that was the beginning of many, many encounters that I've had, and that I still have to this day, as I walk Soma across uh, all over the streets of Yerevan. People walk up to us, and they say, but I want this. And I think they're talking to me, but they're actually talking to my dog. Little by little, I've assembled a sense of Soma's history. Um, I know that she's about two to three years old. I know that she's been pregnant twice. I know that her first litter had produced seven puppies, and she gave birth um, near the, that church that's been under reconstruction forever on Avogion Street. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, all the construction workers took one puppy home after she gave birth. I know that her second um, Pregnancy ended in miscarriage because she walked into that Hayat and was shaking and had a fever. And all the residents of the Hayat came together. Everyone threw in a couple of thousands of grams and they paid to have her operated on and they saved her life. They removed the um, dead fetuses out of her belly and they said, you know what, let's pay a little bit extra. And they had her spayed so she would never have to endure that pain again. But Soma was still wild and free. They let her out, and she would only come back once a day to hang out with her friends and have some food. And once a month, she would go to the veterinarian's door and paw at it to let him know that she was ready for her flea medication. So, Soma is my wild and free dog. She lives in my house. We hang out all the time. But more than anything, she's a reminder to me of the connectivity in this place. Yerevan is charged with this special magic. I'm convinced of it. And this dog is one small example, one of two that I'll share with you today, of the bind, the connections that bind all of us together, even those of us who've never met. The second story I want to tell you is about an accident. In March, I came back to Armenia after three months visiting my family in LA, 
And I have to say, I was feeling iffy about coming back to Armenia. I said, what is my place there? Why am I going back? Well, Soma is there. I have a job. I have some friends. But uh, within a week of getting back here, the city reminded me why, why, why I was here. Essentially, I was in a crosswalk, and the next memory I have is of laying on my back and a woman shaking me, asking me what my name was and what had happened. What had happened was that I was hit by a car while crossing the street. I, it's not clear where I landed. There is video footage of the actual impact. That's a pretty crazy experience. I mean, if you want to talk about modern technology, to watch yourself nearly die on camera is something unprecedented. In the footage, you see me cross the street. The car turns into me, and I just go flying. Who knows where I landed? No one can remember. But what they do remember is that the person who hit me stopped his car immediately. All the people that were in the area ran to help him out. They called an ambulance, had me taken to the hospital. It wasn't until about an hour later that I finally remembered uh, what had happened. I had a memory of a white car bumper on my right side. Um, and that was the beginning of the city kind of smacking its love back into me. Reminding me, like, you were questioning your commitment to, to being with me, you know? And so I was treated with so much love by these complete strangers in the street. And if you want to talk about connectivity, I had a concussion when I hit my head during the accident. So I don't remember everything that happened right after. A friend of mine reminded me of a fact that she apparently had told me right after she visited me, uh, right when she visited me after the accident. Something that I had forgotten, she told me recently. Apparently, she who lives on my street was walking home that night and saw my body laying in the street, but didn't know that it was me. And she heard the, the commotion, she waited to hear if there was a voice coming out of my body. They, she heard me speak and said, okay, she's fine, and went home. A few days later, she was talking to another friend about this weird thing that she had seen, and the friend was like, that was Anna. That was Anna laying in the street. And so the thought that my accident was known by different people in the city, people I knew and people that I didn't know, is something that, again, speaks to these unbreakable binds amongst all of us here. The moment you step foot here, those binds are bound. So, the hospital staff was just another layer of this love. They called me Merach Chiga. They asked me where my family was. I told them I had none here in Armenia. And so little by little, they created a sense of family. And two weeks after leaving the hospital, I was answering a text message, and I heard someone say, Ha, ah, what's this? And I looked up thinking it was another person talking to my dog. But it was the nurse from the hospital. She was just walking, shopping with her daughter. She said, look at Bonsa, how's your head? And I said, oh, it's, it's getting better. I said, I feel like you're watching over me, you're my guardian angel. And she said, you better know it. I mean, that's, if that's not proof of family, I don't know what is. And another layer, for days and days, and to this day, each time another complication arises from the accident, I have 10 people waiting outside my door, ready to help me out. People who I met a week ago, a year ago, or people who I knew in my past life back in LA. I barely even have to ask for help, it just comes. That is something that you don't experience in a spread out, sprawling metropolis like Los Angeles where I grew up, where people exist in their cars and their pods. They only interact when they have to exchange car insurance information. <laughs> Here in Yerevan, whether you like it or not, you're going to see people, you're going to run into people. Every question that you're wondering the answer to will be answered. If you're wondering where your ex-boyfriend is, you're going to see him tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> that is something that I've really struggled with. Um, <laughs> ultimately, I think that it's undeniably magical, uh, whether it's pleasing or displeasing in the moment. And I really believe that some of it has to do with the structure of Yerevan. If you go and look at a map of it, as designed by Tamanya, we all got a great lesson in, in that earlier today from Bahman. It's shaped like a blooming flower. So everything it starts at the center, kind of like the nucleus of an atom, and blooms outward from there. So if you think about Sarian Street that wraps around the center of Yerevan as the outer wall of this atom, and the opera as the nucleus, 
then I guess that makes all of us electrons. And what we do is spin indefinitely inside of that atom. And we crash into each other sometimes. Sometimes we crash into each other because we realize that we're friends with the same street dog. Other times we crash into each other because we fall in love or out of love. Other times we literally crash into each other. But each time what's happening is an exchange of energy. You take something and you give something. And that to me is my relationship with Yerevan. Sometimes we're so simpatico, we're doing so well. And other times Yerevan chews me up and spits me out. But is that not the meaning of life? Of being aware that you're a living, breathing thing, that you can feel pleasure and pain? To have a city that you are living in, that you are spending money in, that you are fighting for, that you are frustrated by, that is so hot sometimes that you just want to die. <laughs> in fact, about the heat in Yerevan, that's the last thing I want to leave you with, as proof that it's a living, breathing thing that you have a relationship with. It's not just me. We're all in a polyamorous relationship with this city. If you think about the summers here, it's really, really hot. It's a landlocked country. Yerevan is built in a dip in the ground, uh, and the heat just kind of sits on top of you. But there are those nights where all of a sudden it gets super hot and humid, and you wonder, where is this coming from? Last time I checked, there are no oceans nearby. It gets super humid, and then this wind comes through, and it just whips and whips and whips at the city, and you hear all the garages in the Hyatt banging open and shut, open and shut. The tin roofs on all the people's additions of their apartment buildings are waving, you know, like the Pacific Ocean. And just when you think that your apartment building is about to fall over because the wind is so strong, it just goes, whoosh, lets out this huge breath, and torrential rain comes down, sometimes for 30 seconds. Just enough to flood your, your yard, but also enough to clear out the air and make everyone, including the city, relax. And all of a sudden you feel like, this isn't so bad after all. I can do this. That's a sign of life in the city and in us. So what I want to leave you all with today is the closing of my love letter. Yerevan is here. It's real. It's us. And I'm with you. Thank you.